She turned away for a moment and then was gone. It's a real deep-seated fear this could happen and all of us are vulnerable. Every 98 seconds, someone is sexually assaulted. And sex creep could strike again. U.S. Department of State issuing an urgent travel advisor. Police told me don't take any shortcuts. Somebody tried to kidnap a teenage girl. It was supposed to be a fun vacation. Instead, it turned into a brush with death. Just landed in France when two men offered her a ride and abducted her. Watch this. It could happen to you. Cheryl Hunter, a women's advocate, author, and rape survivor. Cheryl, and you've been abducted, raped, left for dead. What were you thinking? She's telling her story. Finally, there we are. The big day arrives, and we go to the airport. I mean, and we'd been there second. He asked me if I was a model. What was the strategy that you used to come out of this? You must hide. You must shelter yourself. We were going to shoot photos. I tried to come up with a plan. They drugged me, raped me repeatedly. You described it as having demonic animals on top of you. Why wouldn't she go with him? Tell us what happened then. I arrived and a man with a camera around his neck walked up. I mean, and we'd been there seconds. He said, are you a model? I can make you one. Just come with me and my friend. And they asked if I wanted a glass of wine. And the next thing I knew, I was in a car, and like a, like a dog, I had my head halfway out the window, I was in the passenger seat, with my tongue open and drooling. Did you have any sense of how long it had been? Oh, I had no idea. Was it dark out? No. Where did they take you at that point? The next thing I remembered, I was lying on a cement floor. That's where things began to really come unraveled. They drugged me. They took me to an abandoned construction site and beat me mercilessly. They drugged me again and raped me repeatedly, and they cut me. I had one action available to me, which was just to look away I craned my head as far as I could to the right and just stared at the wall. There was a dancing spot of light on the wall. It must have been a reflection from something outside and it was free, whatever it was. I stared at the little spot of light with all my might and the harder I stared, the more I became the spot of light. I wasn't this scrap heap of a girl being torn to shreds. I was just a dancing, little sparkling shimmer of light that could fly away at any time I chose. We drive back down to town and we get to this place, this grassy area, and he just kind of pushes me out and I kind of fall to the ground and I just lay there like I'm gonna play dead, and he says, darling. And I look, and he snaps my photo. I waited until the car was gone, looked around, and I got up and ran for my life. It's the hardest parts of life that sharpen our blade had successfully, I thought, stuffed my feeling about the abduction. But then a boyfriend I met in Germany, who I was madly in love with, died in a motorcycle accident. That was it, the tipping point. I was either going to die or fight my way back. It's those things that create problems in us that cause us to rise up and face those things and bring out the best in us. And you made that decision in Japan. Tell us what happened then. It was in Japan that the next stage of my journey unfolded. There's a Japanese proverb that after a great storm, you can see more clearly where there is solid ground. I was absent-mindedly daydreaming about how to plot my revenge against the men from France. When the grandmother walked in, and stared at me. She said, ah, wabi-sabi. Wabi-sabi is the most essential of all Japanese principles. 
Wabi Sabi states that the beauty of any object lies in the flaws of that object. Imperfection. Within a few moments, I heard shouting, and she was screaming, Naze! Senso Nihon! Why you make war on Japan? She removed a cloth envelope from one of her bags and carefully unfolded it. The cloth envelope contained two photographs that were both black and white tattered and yellow. One was a man, the other was a woman. She clasped the photos and held them above her head. She started to cry now. And then I accidentally caught her glance. As I did, I saw the confusion and the anger and the rage and the fury and her complete inability to express any of it. I saw the deep, dark pit of her aloneness. I saw me. I said the only two words that made any sense. Wabi Sabi. You've had to overcome some really difficult things in your life. Yours are very dramatic. What was the strategy that you used to handle that for 10 years without ever touching it? I realized that there, perhaps I wasn't seeing it correctly. Perhaps there is such a thing as wabi-sabi and everything that's wrong about me could be my salvation. So I set out to figure out how to make that reality. I'd started taking these personal development seminars and felt so much better when I was there, not so good when I wasn't. And I realized it was a calling. As I was helping others, I was helping myself, but I still had never told my story until one night I was leading one of these seminars, years in, and a woman was raising her hand. She wasn't having it, and nor were the people in the room. People were slamming notebooks. I am for the first time gonna lose the room. And I had a moment with myself and said, you are no longer an 18 year old child who cannot handle whatever people will judge about you. And I told my story for the first time. This woman was set free and so was I. You are magnificent. And what makes you magnificent is everything you've previously believed is wrong with you. I leave you with my deepest wish that you recognize your beauty, that you know your magnificence, that you claim your wabi-sabi. said the only two words that made any sense.